scientists of Reddit. What's a phenomenon in your field that the average person hasn't heard of, that would blow their mind? My research involves Parkinson's disease, and recently there's been findings that contracting an infection such as flu whilst having PD will make the disease progress much faster as your immune system will kill the brain cells responsible, in a kind of accidental collateral damage response. So we're looking at how some anti-inflammatories could slow the progress of PD by stopping infections from taking their toll. Early days though but very promising. Just started a PhD in astrobiology, does that make me a scientist? Looking at microbe behavior in low gravity environments, it turns out that microgravity has a tendency to make microbe populations into these superbugs that are incredibly resistant to antibiotics. There's some worry that this will be a pretty big problem as human space exploration develops. Dialect continuums in linguistics. Among certain languages such as the Slavic languages and the Western Romance languages, Portuguese, Galician, Spanish, Catalan, etc., there is no fine line from where one language ends and another begins. However due to standardization this is largely no longer the case. Instead, you would have one language gradually changing into another as you go farther and farther away. Think of it like in Britain where the farther north you go the more Scottish the dialect becomes, until eventually you have full on Scots. Sort of along the same lines I was fascinated to learn that there are regional dialects in British Sign Language. For example there are at least three separate signs for the holiday depending on where you are in the country. Everyone always associates dopamine with enjoyable experiences or happiness but in a certain part of the brain. How much dopamine is released can be calculated as amount of reward received, amount of reward expected. This is literally a quantitative signal. If you expected there to be 10 sweets in the bag but there were actually 12, then you'd get an increase in dopamine release but not as much as if there were 14 sweets in the bag. Similarly, if you expected 10 and only received 8, you'd actually get a dip in the dopamine signal, but not as much as if you'd only received 6, etc. This is one of those rare examples where a quantitative theory or model, reinforcement learning, can be mapped straight onto a neuroscientific phenomenon. I work with CRISPR Cas9 system. It is essentially allows us to edit the genome, adding and removing nucleotides or whole genes or altering nucleotides. While there were previous methods for editing genome, this is quite simple, requires a few plasmids, less than $100, Basic research lab and someone who can do fairly basic molecular biology research. Researchers in China are using it on humans now for cancer therapy. It also has possibility for HIV treatment. Additionally, the part I find most fascinating and most scary are gene drives. We are able to use it to kill off all mosquitoes, thus eliminating Zika and malaria, in a matter of a few mosquito generations. This would also be theoretically possible for other species hasn't been researched. I have a good one and a bad one. Bad, more than 2 out of every 3 people in the world carry a virus that causes oral genital herpes, HSV 1 and 2. Good, if you genetically remove one of HSV's key genes, GD, you get a vaccine strain that's protected mice against 10x the lethal dose of the deadliest herpes strains every discovered. Nuclear transmutation. It is 100% possible to turn lead into gold by yanking three protons out of a lead nucleus. It was first done in the 1920s. Of course, it's prohibitively expensive and ultimately a waste of money and energy, but it can be done. I'm an earthquake geophysicist. I study something most people have never heard of, slow earthquakes. In a regular earthquake, a fault a crack between big pieces of rock moves, or slips, very quickly. Typically an earthquake takes a few seconds to occur. This rapid movement excites seismic waves, which are similar to sounds waves, that travel through the earth and cause shaking. In slow earthquakes, everything is the same except that high temperatures and or fluid pressures cause the speed of fault slip to max out at a fairly low value. So we might get movement equivalent to what we would see in magnitude 7 earthquake, but instead of occurring over seconds it occurs over weeks, months, or even years. The slowness means no seismic waves and no damage. In fact the traditional instrument used to study earthquakes, the seismometer, won't see these. So we use scientific grade GPS instead and literally watch the rocks move. 
Unfortunately, slow earthquakes, while they relieve the forces where they occur, actually increase the probability of regular earthquakes on other faults or other parts of the same fault. There are documented cases of slow earthquakes triggering regular ones. The Great Tohoku, Japan earthquake of 2011 actually started off two weeks earlier with a slow earthquake. I'm working on trying to find ways to use slow earthquakes to forecast regular ones. Feto maternal transfer. I learned about it in a neuroscience class. Essentially, when a woman is pregnant, stem cells can travel from the fetus to the mother and actually survive for long periods of time in the hippocampus, an area of the brain used for memory formation. I'm pretty sure the stem cells can survive in other parts of the body, but it's really cool to think that some of your DNA is in the part of your mother's brain where new memories are formed. So you've heard of stem cells right? Long story short, cells that can transform into other kinds of cells, while also dividing and reproducing forever. They're responsible for making new blood cells, driving wound healing, etc etc. Neat stuff. It is now fairly accepted in my field that cancers also have stem cells. We think that these cancer stem cells aren't as susceptible to chemotherapy, and is partly responsible for why cancers seem to come back after even very aggressive chemo. But as to their exact identity, strategies to destroy them, and where they come from, we're working on it. Many animals use the location of the sun in the sky for navigational purposes. Many fewer animals use the way sunlight is polarized as a proxy for the location of the sun in the sky. This allows for a mental compass and is how many animals keep moving in their required direction. Many although fewer animals also use the moon for the same purpose. However only one known species the dung beetle uses the way the moon's light is polarized to keep rolling their dung in straight lines. However when the moon is absent from the sky the beetles default to using the location of the Milky Way in the sky for navigation. 15 days of the month of October, from the equator, have both the moon and Milky Way out of vision of the beetles. For these 15 days, they roll in almost random directions, turning frequently and just generally looking drunk. Tropospheric ducting. Shortwave radio signals, up to about 30 MHz, bounce off a layer of charged particles in the atmosphere and are reflected back down to Earth, which is why you hear so many AM stations at night. Normally higher frequencies just poke straight through and go out into space, but under certain conditions they pass through a gap in one layer, hit another, and bounce along between the two like when you get the bull trap behind the bricks in Arkanoid until eventually it bounces back out hundreds of miles away with almost no loss. So, by a sheer accident of meteorology you can sometimes bounce VHF and UHF signals far further than they normally go, and they sound like they're from just down the road. Postmortem brain examination of kids with autism has shown improper cortical distribution. A little background, the layers of your cortex are established very specifically before birth. If you have a healthy brain, you will exit your mother with clearly defined cortical distribution and that layer differentiation does not continue post-birth. Thus, we can conclude that the disrupted cortex structure being found in autistic children cannot be attributed to vaccines which are administered after birth. Furthermore, we can also conclude that autism begins affecting children in the womb. C-section babies are, on average, less healthy and have more compromised immune systems. This is likely because the birth canal is smearing the last bit of mom's immune system programming, before breast milk, as well as helping create a healthy bacterial environment for the newborn. Essentially, a mother's canal walls are coated in things that will help the baby adjust to life outside the womb. C-section babies are starting to get the benefits of this by wiping mom's canal wall fluids onto the baby's face and mouth and head. Surface science. Van der Waals forces between materials are almost universally attractive, but it is possible to create a three material stack of a surface, intermediate, a liquid or potentially a thin film, and contacting material that has a repulsive interaction, meaning that the surface and contacting material will repel each other like two north ends of a magnet. Applications would include surfaces that would be water oil dirt biohazard whatever proof and frictionless interfaces, tested by AFM and undetectable at the peak newton level. Unfortunately the thin films required are not easy or cheap to make and development would be dollar sign dollar sign dollar sign. Not quite mind blowing but definitely exciting. 
We now have microscopes that can achieve resolution in the low NM range in living cells. We can now start to research the dynamics of small subcellular organelles that are important for a wide range of things, such as embryonic development, cancer progression and cell signaling. I'm a dentistry student, and yesterday a paper was published where a group of scientists managed to use an anti-Alzheimer drug in order to build new dentin and damaged teeth. Pulp tissues are already capable of doing that, but research is desperately trying to find agents that can speed up the process, so this is great news. Give a person superpowers in VR. For example the power of flight, will prime concepts of superpowers and the heroes we associate with it and will increase helping behavior. Long story short, there was a study wherein people had to fly with a helicopter or use hand gestures, think Superman, to fly in VR. After the experiment the conductor accidentally spilled a pen case. The people flying like Superman were significantly more prone to jump in and help the conductor to pick up the pens. I really like the idea that people tend to have the desire to use their powers for good rather than to go full on villain. There is a documentary that has been released lately and it's called Most Likely to Succeed. It's about a new education method where it is 90% project based. The teachers don't do much other than just let the students do their projects and give guidance, as well as organize what projects to do. It's a unique way of teaching that only works in specific schools. Some teachers members of society think it's the greatest idea and every school should be using it. Me and other teachers don't see it as straightforward as it seems to be. I recommend giving it a watch though. Right now as we talk, you're being crossed by millions of particles per second and per centimeter square of your body. These very same particles will be able to fly across the earth as easily as if they flew through a vacuum. In fact to reliably stop them you'd have to build a 3 light years thick lead wall. That is, a wall that would be two thirds of the distance between the sun and Alpha Centauri, the nearest star. Said particles are electrically neutral, do not interact through nuclear force, and are 100 feet 000 times lighter than an electron, or perhaps even lighter, 10 minus 36 kilograms. Yet we can detect them every day. Neutrinos are cool. Pretty much everything about sleep is terrifying. Most of all that we don't really know what it is or why we do it or how it works. Why do you sleep? Because you get tired. How do you sleep? Well, here's a list of things that change while you sleep. What is sleep? When you want to wake. What I find most disturbing is sleepwalking parasomnias. Watching people sit up during a sleep study and seeing that they're still asleep. Opening their eyes. Looking around. And then usually they pick out the wires. Maybe lifting them up and tugging gently on them or touching where they are placed on their heads. That's not the creepy part. The creepy part is that they don't pull them off or anything. Instead I have so far only ever seen them all do the same thing. They give up. Like, you can read the facial expression saying frick it, this is too complicated for me to deal with, and they just lie back down and don't go back to sleep because they didn't wake up, but they just close their eyes. It's not that the lights are on but nobody is home, it's the lights are on but you aren't in there. That a sound pressure level of 0 dB doesn't mean no sound. Malaria parasites have shown resistance to every single anti-malarial drug in existence and can develop resistance before new drugs are even finished in trials. Not that there is a big push for anti-malarial drug development. Last I checked there were 7 new drugs for erectile dysfunction in the pipeline for every anti-malarial, and 64 drugs for heart disease. A problem a lot of people in malaria endemic countries would like to live to have. Not a scientist, but Cherenkov radiation is really freaking cool. When electrons travel faster than the speed of light does in water, it gives off an awesome blue glow around nuclear reactors. Google it for some really cool images. This is also what that blue flash is supposed to be when the Enterprise goes to warp. That when I refer to a wiggly hypersurface when presenting my statistics, I'm not kidding at all. Rare earth metals, key ingredients in our modern technologies, especially the green energy and computer worlds, are almost completely mined in China, 90%, from less than a handful of mines. The need for rare earths is only increasing. That about 1% of the noise you see on a TV when it's not tuned, the black and white dots with the horrible noise everyone hates, is interference from the cosmic background radiation. The leftovers of the Big Bang. Some people know but, it blew my mind as a kid. Now I'm a physicist it still does.
Put simply, you can see with pretty good confidence what a chemical compound is by throwing some light at it and seeing what wavelengths come back. Me. Plants are really good at sensing gravity. It's how they keep their shoots growing up and their roots growing down. Literally anyone who will listen. But I thought that light. Me. Yes. Light too. But gravity. Person. But why would you study? Me. Spaceplants. Person. But. Me. Whispering. Spaceplants. Piezoelectrics. Shove the current into a piezoelectric material and it expands. Potential to be stacked on top of one another and act as microactuators, and vice versa. If you apply a stress to a piezoelectric material it produces a current. This is being used in energy harvesting technologies. Imagine the stress being imparted by your trainer impacting the ground as you run. Your trainers could be used to charge your phone. Galaxy lensing. I think it's just beautiful. Just like the way a magnifying glass works to make things appear bigger, large chunks of mass in our universe, that is, galaxies, have a strong gravitational pull over large amounts of space that focuses light giving a distorted look which leads to some special cases, results in an Einstein ring, but not all cases result in this amazing picture. This phenomenon has been used to probe universe and can give good insight into finding better measurements on Hubble constant without local contamination like many other methods. Computer scientist here. Genetic algorithms are pretty neat. It's a branch of heuristics, methods for solving a problem that work but have no proof, because they are trial and error. You may have seen the gif of the polygonal rendered ostrich. Velociraptor type thing that's learning to walk. The cool thing is that the rendering is literally evolving. It starts off with little to no information on how to walk, and just does something random. But it has favorable trays set by the programmer to pass on to the next generation. Just like real world natural selection. Basically, the rendering falls over, and passes data onto the next generation, which also does something random. Each generation gets more and more data on how to walk. And usually by 1000 or so generations the rendering can walk just like how you'd expect an animal to. These are the same techniques used in development of neural networks and I. You just give it a set of conditions to look for, and just, let it go. The Casimir effect. Simply put, if two uncharged plates are brought very close together, due to the presence of virtual particles, the plates are forced together. Only smaller WAVA functions can fit between the plates, meaning less virtual pairs are created there, creating a pressure difference between the inside and outside, forcing the plates together. Power industry. Power quality and the relation of real and reactive power is pretty neat. Imagine electricity is like beer. Real power is the liquid. Reactive power is the foam. You don't want your beer flat, but you also don't want a glass full of foam. Reddit is pretty high on wind energy, but one major issue is wind turbines eat up reactive power without providing much into the grid. You have to compensate for it with really expensive, complicated capacitor banks or other means to provide reactive power. I think it's pretty fascinating. Brain Computer Interfaces BCI. Maybe people have already heard of them, but I suppose many people might be surprised that it is actually possible to, for example, type just using your brain with a non-invasive, outside the skull, sensor that directly measures the electrical activity of your brain. Not only can you type, but there are prototypes where you can drive your wheelchair around etc. And in addition to the explicit command BCI, there are also systems where you can passively detect how a person interpreted a stimulus. For example, we can detect whether a person found certain keyword or scientific abstract relevant to their interests or whether they found a joke funny or not. Well, we can say with more than 50% accuracy anyway. In addition to BCIs, other physiological signals like heart rate, skin conductivity, pupil size, activity of any particular muscle etc. can be used in many surprising ways. Google Physiological Computing and Effective Computing extracellular matrix we'll be able to regrow limbs probably in our lifetime spray on skin cells they take your own stem cells and spray them on severe burns and the skin regrows this is pizza cat he looks for people like you to befriend and give them the gift of unlimited pizza this can only be granted if you comment pizza please thanks for watching if you are new to the channel you can subscribe i publish new videos every day until then 
check another video, or don't. Either way, have a great day you magnificent people.